Thank you so much for coming. Um, I was a bit worried how to break the silence after this film, but let me just start by thank, thank you for being here tonight and for bringing this film to the Frontline Club and for sharing it with the audience. As, as I said in the beginning, um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. We have a microphone. Uh, I'll come, come to you first, but maybe uh, both of you are here. You're the director, you're the producer. There's always different ways in involvement and collaborating. So I'd like uh, to ask you if you could maybe start by the beginning, bring us back to how, how the idea about making this film about the film came together. Maybe I understand that it started with, with you? Yes, I, um, I was actually, it, it started about four years ago when I was having a, a coffee with Toby Haggath at the Imperial War Museum. And he told me that he was just about to start digitally remastering and completing a film that had been shot when the Allies had liberated the concentration camps. And I hadn't realized at that point that all the footage that I'd seen and the fragments of film um, in documentaries about the Holocaust had actually pretty much come from this film. And it had been part of a much bigger, more considered film. And when he started describing the footage I, and the story behind it, I knew that it would be something I wanted to take further and really explore that moment of, of liberation and, and the challenges of bearing witness to atrocity. And, and for me, that was the starting point. And then when Andre and I started working together on it, I think the key thing was to have first-hand witnesses rather than to sort of filter it through historian's interpretation. And that was a key thing that Andre felt. Uh, <laughs> I think my initial reaction to the story was, I think as any filmmaker confronted with that material or with that knowledge can perceive that there is something important to be said there. Um, and I initially felt this was something that needed a, a major filmmaker behind it um, to give it a a kind of a different perspective than rather a sort of more reportage approach to the subject matter. So because I came out of the Granada television stable, so Bernstein, in fact, was my initial boss, um, I thought it would be rather good to find a great filmmaker who had some association with Granada. So the initial phase of this was to say let's get some big name director involved in this and I approached Paul Greengrass who I'd worked with at Granada <coughs> and Paul very generously said a wonderful story, I'd love to do it but I'm doing, you know, it wasn't quite born, revisited but other major feature films I can't remember what at the time so Paul backed out of it so I then went to Number two, which was my captain, and my captain, who knew Bernstein well and who I'd worked with in the past, said, fantastic story, but you know what? I'm a bit old. I'm living in Los Angeles. It's a long way away. Um, and I'd be far too depressed to be able to tackle this story. So Mike backed out. I then went to Stephen Frears, who I thought, who wasn't a member of Granada, but we thought Stephen Frears would be a very appropriate film director, and he also said, wonderful story, I can see there's a great film there, but um, I'm doing Philomena, and I'm not sure I'm the right person to do this, and so on. So eventually, um, uh, it landed in my lap, and I decided to try and do it myself. And Stephen remained a sort of amanuensis figure in the background, looking and giving comment as, as we went along. Um, and then it was really a lengthy, painful in many levels, but clearly because of the material and the people and the different emotions and anguish that went through all of this, um, process of evolution and I think that was where the, the process changed as we went along and spoke to people and saw more material and found stories that wove in so it was not a it was not a project that you could see the film this was the film it, it actually did shape and take time before it came together um, 
And I think I think if there's one major um, theme that I feel most strongly about that the film should respect, it is that the story was something that had to be told by the people who experienced it and were engaged in it, not by others. So initially we had a lot of historians, we had a lot of second-tier interviewees. Uh, I mean, any of you here is in the film world will realise you know, that the, the process, you could imagine the process we went through and we took very eminent historians to the camps and we interviewed them there and so on and so forth. Um, and in the end, there was something that didn't work because it felt like um, it felt like uh, a, a sort of a, as I said earlier, a sort of reportage rather than a film, an experiential film. And so all of them we swept off in the end and, and had a lot of sort of angst about how to do that and upset a lot of historians who wanted to see themselves on screen. Um, but ended up, I think, with the right combination of um, characters who had the right to tell their own story and the right to interpret what was happening at that time for another audience 70 years on. Uh, so. How difficult was it to find these people and to convince them to tell their story again or maybe for the first time in it a long was, period? It was... It was... I mean, there were difficulties. We had a lot of research had to go into it, a lot of archive research, a lot of piecing together. Uh, one of our researchers at the back there. Um, and it was a pretty complex process of putting together, but the rather terrible truth about this whole story is that we are 70 years on and most of the people who should be telling the story are no longer with us. Um, and so, in the end, um, there is not a huge array of survivors who appeared on film, and we were very anxious to find characters who were on the film that the British cameraman and the American cameraman filmed, so we could piece the, their stories together. Um, there weren't many left, so it was a rigorous process, but, um, but we were restricted by time more than anything else. Um, and in the end, I think I think you see from one or two examples we found there with um, Ferenz, for example, or with um, George at the beginning, characters had kept this material. It was it was it was an internal keeping of the material and very emotional. And when they started talking. Um, it, it came out it, uh, emotionally and um, people were, were on the verge of breakdown and it was very it's a very difficult process I think in terms of filmmaking as well which is um, the trauma that you're creating uh, is something that preys on your mind as a filmmaker as well and it, yet it yet yet I think I feel, at any rate, I feel the justification is that everybody who participated in the film um, overwhelmingly insisted that this was absolutely important and imperative to tell. And their own personal angst or trauma was something that um, none of us were pleased or proud about, but was something that contributed, I think, to show how important that subject was. Yeah, absolutely. Could we get the microphone to the gentleman in the first row, please? If you could speak, I have to confess, I'm I'm part deaf, so I, you have to speak reasonably clearly. It's both. It is. It will be shown in Germany. Um, MDR have um, supported the film, and uh, it it will be going on release in Germany, and also it'll be on television uh, in Germany. Uh, America here and France and throughout Europe in January next year um, and I think we both pretty much agreed that it was oh, I think we did anyway um, about the process of filming the atrocities of that moment of actually confronting 
as a cameraman, as an editor, as a filmmaker, or that we wanted to explore. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a genuine conundrum about um, the direction the film goes. I, I think that we, this, the, the starting point of doing the film was that this was very much going to be different in as far as it was going to be a film about the original film, the reconstruction of that film, the importance of that film, the, to some extent, the extraordinary role of the cameraman, who I think is the, the, the most profound sort of difference that we were following. I personally, although I have some layman's knowledge of um, the situation in the camps and the end of the war, I got more and more absorbed by the chaos of 1945, that political cauldron that was happening in 1945, um, before the end of the war, then after the end of the war, the Palestine issue, the political situation in England, the problems in Germany at that time, at the end of the war, and felt that... Um, even someone of my sort of age and experience didn't really understand or didn't know what was happening at that time. And, and I, I think the sort of tensions in terms of how we proceeded with the film came from that particular moment of, are we telling a narrow story about the film itself or are we trying to paint a broader picture? And I started veering much more um, into that area of the broader picture because I thought it was, I mean, I'm, I'm, I may be being patronising, people all knew about it, but I didn't. And I felt that there was, a, there was a fascinating story that we didn't know about what was happening in 1945. And things in the film that um, I, I, I still find intriguing is that you, know, you, you come to the point of, um, April, when it was a very clear vision of what this film was about. Bernstein was commissioned and it had approval from the Allied governments to make a film as propaganda, which was then didn't have quite the negative connotation that we sometimes associate with it. This was propaganda to show to the German people the crimes they had committed or had been committed in their name under the Third Reich. That was, that was what the film was for. And that was what he was aiming at. Then comes the end of the war. Then came the responsibilities of the Allied governments in Germany. Um, people starving, Germany collapsing. The enmity with the Soviet Union it, beginning to evolve at that particular time. And you had a peculiar situation where the Germans are now allies. We've beaten them. Forget about that. The Soviets are now the enemies. We've got to worry about them. What we don't want is something that's going to embarrass the German people even more. And this all happened literally within two months at the end of the war. Bernstein knew that his job was finished, that allied combination had collapsed by... May, June, because the Americans were going one way, the British were going another way. British government was changing. By July, we had Churchill out, Attlee was in. Um, Ernest Bevan, foreign secretary, came in in July, virulently anti-Zionist, didn't want anything that was going to give him problems in Palestine. Um, and so the whole situation was dramatically different in that period of time. Um, and so that seems to me a, a fascinating... So it's, you know, as a filmmaker, I would have loved to have found the conspiracy theory where this film was, the original film, 1945, was axed because of conspiracy that was going on behind the scenes in the British government. And that's just not the case. It was, it was a complete mess in Germany, in Britain, 
people going in different directions, different priorities. Uh, we were leading up to the war in the East and the, and, and the atomic bomb and so on. So it, it, it does not surprise me that that film was never shown. Um, and I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to have been given people the chance to say, you know, it was an embarrassment because of Palestine or whatever. There's no historical documentation that says this is the reason that the film was axed. Uh, we never found that. We looked and looked and looked to see if there was a conspiracy theory. There, there really wasn't. It was just bad timing, bad situation at the time, and... It was an embarrassment. Let's get rid of the damn thing and let's put it under the sweep it under the carpet and one day perhaps we'll dig it up again. And and I was always surprised that Bernstein himself, and I've never found the answer to this, Bernstein himself becoming a media mogul in Britain, running Granada television, having the power to do what he wanted, never revived the film himself and never wanted the film shown. I, I, I've no under I no sort of comprehension for that. Um, absolutely right. Um, um, there are two sort of sides to that. Number one was that um, certainly Sally was one of those who pressed quite hard that we should find Germans and we wanted to find people who, for example, were brought from Weimar to have a look at the so on and so forth. That would have been interesting if we could have located a child or somebody there who so on. I mean, Number one, we never found them. We did, we did look, but we never found them. Um, secondly, I was not over distraught about that because I was not trying... I think, I think what I was looking at was our perception through the filmmakers and the cameramen and the editors of the time in putting that film together. I wasn't trying a, to put a sort of comprehensive story together about everything to do with the camps there. I mean, I think, I think had we found somebody, we would have incorporated them. But I don't find myself that that's a missing element in the final film, because I think it is a perception, you know, if, if it's a perception of those who participated who, who were looking outward rather than a question of pointing the fingers. I, I mean, I have no question in my mind who's guilty and who's not guilty, so I wasn't trying to um, exonerate anybody in that sense. Um, but it would have been interesting, but I have, I have no real uh, other answer to that. Um, I think perhaps we, we both may have an opinion on that. I think, I think there was a... I think there is a genuine and major issue about how and whether we should show atrocity footage like that at all. Um, when we started the work on this, um, the first thing we all found out was, in fact, this footage is out there um, because of new social media and uh, availability of the web and all the rest of it, that if you Google properly, you can find most of the footage on the web. It is out there. Um, in the 1980s, there was an extraordinary sort of gap between the end of the war and the 1980s where people went quiet about the story of the camps. Um, and it's an interesting fact, as a sort of slight detour, but I'll come back to what you're saying, is that there is no um, footage in existence except for one minute and 59 seconds of the actual Holocaust material, genocide material during the war, because Himmler in 1941 laid down the ruling that Nobody must record this. I mean, already the guilt process in the German mind was there, in the, in the Nazi mind was there, that footage of shootings, killings, atrocities must not be recorded. And the obedience of the German people was extraordinary in that only one error slipped up and one German officer actually filmed some atrocity material, which is 
from one. So all of the material we have of that period is post-war. It's in the camps after the event. So there is no direct genocide footage except for this one footage. It's just an interesting thing. Um, when the storyline um, came up that how much and whether we should be using um, atrocity footage, I think my own feeling is that atrocity footage used out of context is pornography. I mean, it just has no rationale or reason to be used. I think if put in context and explained why, then it carries, I think, the message that one needs to carry with it of of the shock that you need to see, the, the emotion that you need to understand to realise what, what this is. Now, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this recently simply because I was engaged also in the Indonesian film, The Act of Killing, and, and, the, and its follow-on film that's just about to be released. And there you have a film where there is not a single shot of a single body of a single death. It is all surreal reenactment and so on, and yet carries an emotional impact as well. But I think in terms of, you know, the, the, of this, I think you have to, you know, you, how much you use and how extensive you use it and how, if you like, in your face you use it is a moot point and, and there's a balance one has to draw. And I think nearly 50% of the footage we were tempted to use, we pulled out of the film because... Uh, we we didn't want to overwhelm and just continually plug. And it's interesting in terms of if you're breaking down the film that you've just seen that most of the real atrocity footage were sections from the original film, those clips. Those clips amount to 12 minutes in the overall film. It It seems a lot longer, but it's not. It's 12 minutes out of a 75-minute film. There are other shots of the graves and so on in the context of what the cavalrymen are doing as well. Um, but I think, I think we were careful to try and determine that we would only use them where the context was important to get across the message. I, I'm too close to it. I've been too swamped by it for the last... A uh, year and a half and so on to actually judge anymore, but I, I, I think, or I hope, we have the balance about right. I think also it's worth saying that in 1945, when those cameramen went in, they were very aware they were using a camera to gather evidence, and that they had to get up close. And part of their filming close-ups was about their anger as well, about showing what was going on and making sure that the world knew about that. And I, and I think it's very important that we see that in that context as well. Even now, 70 years later, we're shocked by it because we've, we don't show things in that same way. But it's very important to get that message across and to show the courage of those original filmmakers as well in the right context. And one of the other things that's been interesting with regard to the original film, German Concentration Camp's Factual Survey, is that um, one of the sequences that's provoked most discussion isn't about the bodies, it's about women showering and the camera dwelling at this moment of uh, healing, I suppose, where it feels pornographic to some extent because you, the camera is dwelling for too long on women enjoying themselves in the shower. And that's been very controversial. And I, and I think there are all these decisions that we've looked at as we've been making the film about what's, what's appropriate, what's acceptable, and how we, how we go about that now um, and I think I hope we've got the balance right the story of the in a way the revelation of what was happening in um, uh, and why it was restored actually contemporary was that in 1984 Caroline Moorhead uh, biographer and journalist and uh, a very astute person was writing the biography of Sidney Bernstein. She interviewed him and in his life came across a kind of a gap 
that he had not really talked about, there was no information about, and it was this period towards the end of the war to after the war. And she pushed, and he told her about the film. And she thought this was, so this, she was including this in the biography, but she thought this was important enough to reveal to the public. So before her book was published, she wrote an article in the Times, which was put on the front cover of the Times in 1984, and the Times picked it up and said, Hitchcock film revealed, or hidden, unknown Hitchcock film revealed. And so suddenly there was this article on the front page of the Times about a film that nobody knew about that suddenly was important. So this sort of had a... There's a media sort of furore in 1984, and people put pressure on the Imperial War Museum at that time, um, including the Berlin Film Festival, who read this article, and said to the Imperial War Museum, why don't you bring the footage you've got and show it in Berlin, because it's important for the Germans. So following on for your question about earlier on about um, showing in Germany. So um, a curator from the Imperial War Museum, in fact, the, the man who was interviewed later on, Kay Gladson, part two, <coughs> took the five cans of film, no commentary, sixth can was missing. He took those five cans of film to Berlin. It was shown in Berlin in 1984 in the film festival, created quite a stir, even without commentary. And PBS, who were at the Berlin Film Festival, said, this is incredibly important, we have to show this film. So PBS, um, it's a slight shaggy dog story, I'll keep it as short as I can. PBS then recorded Crossman's script, which they had on paper. They had Trevor Howard record the script, recorded the script, um, and still not no sixth reel, that was still missing, and showed it on PBS with Trevor Howe's commentary. Again, a lot of people took notice of it, and it was shown. Pressure at that time then came back to the UK on Bernstein, saying, you know, why aren't you showing this in the UK? And he, for reasons I still don't understand, decided not to show the film, but agreed that Granada could make a film about the film. And they put together some interviews and interviewed a few camp survivors and interviewed Sidney Bernstein himself and put on a film on, uh, on Granada television at that time. And that, for us, was very fortunate because we had some of the last surviving cameramen and so on re records and Sidney Bernstein himself talking about the film but they did not go into much depth and it was it was um it was okay as a film it was an interesting film but it was not uh, very revealing I felt yeah. the first part of what you said uh, about the reaction not just a show but you know other other films Alan Rene's film and so on and so forth uh, and, and to some extent, actually, when the film finished here and when the Imperial War Museum showed their film, their reconstruction, there is a reaction from an audience which is not quite knowing how to react. So one hopes for the right reasons that people are slightly numbed and shocked by what they've seen, but it's not a, it's not, none of these are films that you feel warrant applause in the sort of normal filmic sense um, and so that's a it's a very difficult thing so as, as a filmmaker you know you sort of finish a film and you hope that everyone's going to stand up and give you a standing ovation or something so it never happens and it shouldn't happen with a material like this so. in terms of the use of this footage you have to remember that all of the British army material was given in trust by, by the British government to the Imperial War Museum, which is a government organisation, who are the hosts, if you like, for the public of that material. So you are entitled to go and ask if you can see any of that material and use it. And if your reason for using it is okay, then they will allow you to. 
um, other material from America, from Soviet Union, and so on, is slightly more complex. I mean, some of it's in the Imperial War Museum, others is in, in the, um, uh, the Washington Museum, in Yad Vashem, in Israel, in various other things. But the material is generally accessible um, to anybody who digs. It's just that people tend not to dig because it depends what use you have for it. So the the film, the German concentration camps film and the footage, some of that has been shown before in newsreels, some of it has not. Some of the material around it we found in the Imperial War Museum where the German concentration camps footage had been taken out of. So we, we, we had access to all the rushes of all the material that's there. So there's a, there's a lot of material there that has not been used, has not been seen, because there's no context for it. Um, so other filmmakers, other films have access to the same material. What they've used and what they haven't used, I can't tie down. But certainly Claude Landsman's footage was unique to him, because that was based on his interviews and his, his, his phenomenal sort of trapping of that. So he wouldn't have used that footage. I think I think I think we were we were more narrative driven, which is that when we, for example, I mean, for me, the episode that I like in film terms most about the film is the first section of the entry to Bergen Belsen, because I think we we didn't plan that in quite the way it turned out because we were looking for anybody or any individual who might have been involved in that particular operation um, who might have been captured on film but we were if you like in inverted commas lucky as filmmakers in that I found that when we had um, um both the soldier who was in the first jeep, we had the officer who um, was bringing the captured Germans in, who then became commander of the refugees afterwards. Um, we had the uh, girl in the camp looking outwards, um, and we had Anita who was one of those rescued. We had four characters there, none of whom knew each other, uh, none of whom had ever met, but all were able to tell the same story from a different perspective. Um, and I think once you've got elements like that that you can put together, A, it, it kind of dismisses for me any question about you know are you as are you as just a storyteller making this up as a filmmaker or is this really genuine sort of events that happened and I think they become the witnesses to me of, of, of events and it was why having the historians in the end telling that story seemed to be not just superfluous but intrusive because it was those characters' story, and they were able to tell it to us, and I and I and it, it, I found that incredibly engaging and incredibly emotive that they they could they could do that. So I think I think that those sort of witnesses are absolutely critical to the film being slightly different to, uh, to you know what I've often said: Are you doing yet another Holocaust film? You know, there's this kind of slight sort of tiredness that goes through ripples through people when you say what are you tackling and doing the holocaust and it's, and it's not that it's uh, i think it is i think it is different and as, as i said earlier on i think it's the last chance to be able to do that um so i i feel i feel very pleased and i i was happy that they themselves were very moved by what they saw and what they wanted so that i think is if you like, that's more important testimony than any critic would come across. I think indeed these 
Their words, their testimony really touches touches you. And, and there's so many things still that I, even after watching the film for the third time already, uh, that still touch me, move me, and also make me think about how important context is, especially in today's media age where we get lots of images without context and we're bombarded about them. So it was very, very powerful film for many reasons. So I would like to thank both of you very much for coming here tonight. Before uh, I ask, uh, before we all go our separate ways, uh, maybe I'd like to say that it is, uh, it was just a preview film tonight. So there's a couple more preview screenings go coming and then uh, uh, the film is on release. I don't know if you have any more information yes, on where opening, to find. It's on opening on Friday. Uh, September the 19th and there's lots of information on the BFI website about where the various screenings are so please do check it out. Thank you very much. Can, please. Can, yes, can of course. One yes. One final thing. It is that the tragedy of this whole story lies in uh, what I thought Crossman's script which I think was wonderful. I think Crossman wrote a beautiful and emotive script for that film. And it's why, incidentally, our own script was kept very low-key in contrast to what Crossman was writing. But his last words, which were so powerful, I think, both in the original film and in the clip we used here, which was, by God's grace, the night will fall if we don't learn from these images, but by God's grace, we who have witnessed this will learn or have learned, and we see now in everything we've seen subsequent to World War II in 10, 15 different cases that, of course, we haven't learned. And it's sort of, you know, the tragedy, I think, of the film lies in those words, particularly. So. So.